Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm reviewing a book titled Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. And the book is written by A.J. Agrawal, Joshua Gans, and Avi Goldfarb. Uh, the book was published in 2018, th so three years ago, by Harvard Business Review Press. I should also mention that the authors have a non-profit organization that helps science-based startups, and it is here in Toronto. The organization is called Creative Destruction Lab, or CDL. So what kind of book is this? The prediction machines. The authors present the book as an aid to uh, business owners or business managers who are considering to implement AI technology in their organization. People who are either considering or have already decided that they want to implement some kind of AI technology. So they want to maybe increase their technological awareness and literacy. We read, for example, uh, that there is often no single answer to the question of which is the best AI strategy or the best set of AI tools because AI involves trade-offs. More speed means less accuracy, more autonomy, less control, more data, less privacy. That was from the first chapter. Uh, the book is therefore a general introduction, or we can read it as a general introduction to AI uh, at a very abstract, non-technical level, uh, the potential impact of AI on the functioning of organizations, on human judgment, on the process of decision-making, and the broader impact of AI on society, the job market, uh, inequality, and so forth. I should make it more precise, uh, refine this term AI, what the authors mean uh, by it, and then also talk about the author's perspective, which is grounded in economics, grounded explicitly in economics. So I will unpack those uh, respectively. So AI in this book refers to domain-specific artificial intelligence based on machine learning techniques that enable software to learn from experience, experience uh, meaning exposure to data, uh, often guided, a kind of guided exposure to data. What the machines then enable or what the machines then produce is prediction. That's why the title of the book is Prediction Machines. So in chapter three, the authors give us an extensive discussion of the meaning of this word prediction. It might be a little bit different from what we might associate uh, as you know, this word to mean. We usually, when we use the word uh, prediction, we are talking about the future, uh, the ability to foresee uh, forecast something that has not happened yet and will might happen in the future. But here we read that in addition to generating information about the future, prediction can generate information about the present and the past. This happens when prediction classifies credit card transactions as fraudulent, a tumor in an image as malignant, or whether a person holding an iPhone is the owner based on the image of the person. So here the word prediction is being used to uh, talk about this ability to get from the appearances to, be, to behind the appearances, to get to the reality of things. So that is the sense in which prediction is being used. In chapter four, uh, we read about the distinction between machine learning and the uh, traditional statistical methods, namely the regression models, and when and why machine learning techniques became superior and preferable, um, how those two kinds of approaches, what do they prioritize and how they, are, how they are conducted. Chapter six compares and contrasts um, machine prediction with human prediction. So let's read a little bit from chapter six. Prediction machines are better than humans at factoring in complex interactions among different indicators, especially settings with rich data. As the number of dimensions for such interactions grows, the ability of humans to form accurate predictions diminishes, especially relative to machines. However, humans are often better than machines when understanding the data generation process confers an advantage, especially in settings with thin data. So there is a process by which data is collected. And sometimes that process, how data is collected, the decisions for 
that go into collection of data. Sometimes that is important in making a decision. And uh, usually, as the authors point out, that is associated with a human understanding of the situation. Then we read, humans have cognitive models. Uh, they could be wrong models, but we have cognitive models and thus can make predictions based on small amount of data. Having a model means bringing an understanding, an already existing understanding to a situation, deciding that a, a metaphor or a model is applicable or a good representative of the situation at hand. And of course, when we have a model, then not much data is needed. Um, and human prediction by exception is introduced. This is a, a little, little uncomfortable phrase at first, but uh, it refers to situations where the machine identifies, the machine can identify an instance as an exception. And because it is an exception, the, the experience of the machine doesn't allow for uh, an accurate or adequate response. So by after identifying something as an exception, then the machine calls for human judgment, the necessity of human judgment. So that is what the authors call human prediction by exception. The authors offer uh, an economist's perspective on prediction machines. This is the way in which the, the whole book is framed. That means, so what, is, what do we mean when we, when we say treatment is from an economist's perspective? It means that it involves an examination of the costs and value of prediction, the cost and value of the complements to predictions, so things that go hand in hand with, with prediction, examining the consequences of the decrease in the cost of prediction and the possible trade-offs involved in adopting different strategies using AI. In chapter two, we read, the drop in the cost of prediction will impact the value of other things, increasing the value of complements, data, judgment, and action. So these things, their value added. So uh, a common example to, to make this point is when we imagine the value of coffee decreasing. If the value of coffee decreases, then the value of its complements, like cream and sugar, will increase. So here the value of uh, prediction, the cost of prediction goes down, but the complements, the value of its complements, like data, judgment, and action, will increase. Uh, what will diminish, what value, uh, diminishing the value of substitutes here, in this case, it is human prediction, the value of human prediction, uh, which also happens to be less accurate, uh, goes down. In chapter 17, uh, we read a very interesting example of a trade-off. I think if you pay attention to it, it has uh, several generalizable features. So let's read this together. This is, as I said, from uh, chapter 17. We are reading about a navigation app named uh, Waze, W-A-Z-E. Navigation app Waze collects data from other Waze users to predict the location of traffic problems. It can find the fastest route for you personally. If that were all it was doing, there would be no issue. However, prediction uh, alters human behavior. Prediction alters human behavior, which is what Waze is designed to do. When the machine receives information from a crowd, its predictions may be distorted by that fact. For Waze, the problem is that its users will follow its guidance to avoid traffic problems, perhaps through side streets. Unless Waze adjusts for this, it will never be alerted that a traffic problem is alleviated and the normal route is once again the fastest. To overcome this obstacle, the app must therefore send some human drivers back toward the traffic jam to see if it is still there. Doing so presents the obvious issue. Humans so directed might be sacrificial lambs for the greater good of the crowd. Not surprisingly, this degrades the quality of the product for them. So for some users, the app will have to say to, to update its, uh, its information and prediction it has to lie to them and say, the traffic is gone, go, go ahead. <laughs> so for me, and with my background in psychology, for me, this book was important because of its attention to decision and judgment and the author's analysis of decision-making and tasks. So if you, uh, if you ever check my book, my 2019 book, Experimental Psychology and Human Agency, I have a whole chapter there, chapter five, and a lot of chapter four on the 
concept of task. What is a task? That's the title of my chapter four. What is a task? So I'm really interested in that topic. And there were a lot of uh, relevant information here in this book for my interests. And from a psychological perspective, the book was interesting. Um, when, whenever, I think, whenever a new tool or a new method or a new technology is introduced in an existing activity, so there's an existing activity, it's already ongoing, people are already engaged with that activity. But a new tool is, comes in, is, is introduced in that existing activity. When that happens, it forces us to break our habits and it creates a distance from us and our activities. And it, it kind of interrupts our habitual ways of thinking and acting. And it makes us aware of what is involved in what we are already doing, like decision-making process, our default decisions become apparent to us. And it also uh, opens up the, discussion, uh, the, the path of thinking about how what we are already doing can change. So relevant to this, uh, there are several chapters discussing decisions, process decision, decisions. Chapter 13 is titled Decomposing Decisions. And uh, here we read, tasks need to be decomposed in order to see where prediction machines can be inserted. This allows you to estimate the benefit of the enhanced prediction and the cost of generating that prediction. Chapter 14 is titled Job Redesign. And here uh, we get a discussion of different ways in which that insertion, that redesigning uh, a task can influence human performance. So here we read, uh, AI tools may augment jobs performed by humans, as in the example of spreadsheets and bookkeepers, like calculators also have that, that consequence. They augment human performance. Uh, they may contract jobs, as in the fulfillment centers, they may lead to the reconstruction of jobs with some tasks added and others taken away, as with radiologists. AI technology may also shift the emphasis on the specific skills required for a job, as with school bus drivers. So when school buses are replaced with self-driving school buses, it will not be the case that no adult is needed to, to be with the kids. There might still We might still decide that there, we need an adult with the kids for this purpose of supervision, taking care of them, paying attention to them. But in that case, uh, we are shifting emphasis from driving kids and maybe implicitly supervising kids. And the emphasis is shifted to, towards supervise, supervising them, uh, making sure that they are uh, safe, they're, they're safe while traveling to and back from school. So the book was uh, quite interesting. It was an interesting reading experience for me. Uh, I would be interested in reading something a little bit more technical than this. Um, I appreciated the economist's perspective. Um, it was a nice, specific way of framing the discussion. If you have read this book or if you're interested in reading this book, let me know. The comments, questions, uh, feel free to share them below. If you're interested in supporting this YouTube channel, the best way is to go through Patreon. Uh, we have an ongoing reading group that meets twice a month. And um, we are at the moment finishing our discussion of Carl Jung and some texts by Jung. And um, we are going to read something new uh, in the near future, two or three weeks from now. All right, that's all for now. Until next time.